Wow. Great gun, dude. Great gun. This thing shoots really, really good. Very accurate. Great looking rounds right there. Expensive. Holy freak. Wow. Jeez, that's accurate. Wow. Hit. 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 Hit, same spot, last one. Hit, middle, just right of center. Hit, low, low center. Almost the same spot as the last. Nice. Low center. Hit. Middle right. This gun is excellent. Go and buy one now. There's your five second review. We're going to talk about why I think it's excellent. I make my case in these GRVs. The data, I think, is very solid. If you watch the whole video, I think you'll agree the Smith & Wesson M&P 10 is simply outstanding. And because I will mostly rave about this gun, I want to set this as a foundation for this GRV and for every review I've ever done or will do here in TMP. No one has ever paid me to do a review, especially a positive review. Never, never has happened, never will happen. I gotta tell you, I was so naive, dumb, when I started the Nut Fancy Project about the industry, how it worked, secret deals, give and take, quid pro quo, not anymore. I have a pretty good understanding of how the gun industry, the outdoor industry works. I have a lot of industry insiders that give me this information. I don't want to go into details. Just be careful what you watch. Be discerning. Not every review you see is honest. Some were bought here on YouTube, blogosphere, print media. I think most of you know that, right? Maybe you don't. That's why I want to throw it out there. I'm not going to make a video on it. I'll just leave it at that. And I want to leave that as a foundation now because Smith & Wesson didn't give me no money for this review. I just love the gun. In fact, dude, if you came up to me and said, hey, nothing, watch your videos. I'm a sub. I support you. I want a 308 battle rifle, a sapper. What's your top recommendation? One more. This is, of course, assuming I haven't posted this video yet. I would recommend this one right here. The Smith & Wesson MMP-10. On the top is an MMP-15 Magpul, modified by me. I may do a separate review on that. I've reviewed a few Smith & Wesson firearms at this point, 8th year, that fancy project. I know how they put guns together. And i got to tell you, their quality is pretty 
Excellent. I pursued this review. I wanted to get this gun and review it. I shot it in 2013 in the cheese grater shoot, and I liked it, uh, but I was a little bit prejudiced by this, the thin barrel. I think I said that in that drill, right? I think some of y'all were like, hey, review the MP 10 I, I get review requests all the time. I can only fit in maybe 5% of them. I wasn't stoked. But then I started digging on my own, just seeing what the industry's doing in the world of 308 AR-15 style of rifles, AR-10. Start digging around, looking at the MP 10 closer, and I was like, I need to test that gun. I'm curious if it's as good as I think it might be. Barrel profile was notwithstanding. Top recommendation as of now, subject to change, is this gun. And I'm talking over pretty much everything I brought to the table. And it's not just that it's all that, but I'm talking at the price point yeah. you'll pay for this rifle, the performance you're going to get. We call it first cool, second cool. It's been that way forever here. This one is model number 811308, by the way. They have a camouflaged version, 811312. I am encouraging Smith & Wesson to come out with a free float rail. To look just like that one put a troy alpha rail on it same barrel same gas system put a really nice trigger on it magpul furniture moe grip grip butt stock awesome same gun but you're just going to save your dude from having to go out and fiddle around and port more, put more money and time into perfecting a nearly perfect rifle it is that good and yes, I'm excited about it. Genuine excitement. Philosophy of use, I'm gonna go real fast because I've done a lot of 308 battle rifle reviews. The FNAR, the RFB, the M1A, on and on. DPMS, not a ton, but the ones I like. The ones like this gun I was attracted to. Went out, spent the time and money to research, bring it to tabletop. Uh, I'll tell you what, if SAWC will permit, this is the launch point for all my POU discussions on a sapper style rifle, I'm taking a 308. This gun. It hits harder, complicates armor cool solutions, time. goes through glass, right. goes through barriers better. As you will see and have seen, it is easily capable out to 700 yards, maybe longer. I don't know if I'd feel comfortable shooting it past then again. or past that distance, maybe. But that's a long way for a direct direct gas impingement AR-10 style of rifle. Yeah, we are out at 707 yards. I'm going to post that as a separate video. OJ, Matt, with this gun on the table. He had an MP10. Stock trigger. Stock forearm. Hitting it, 707. That's pretty good. That classifies it, if we're talking about POU, as a sapper. Semi-automatic precision rifle chambered in 7.62 by 51. Right? And if you're wondering, it'll shoot both. 308, 7.62, 51. No problem. Totally interchangeable. It's a heavy hitter. If SAWC is tight, then I would go with a 5.56. Ideally, 77, 75 grains. Maybe a 6.8 SPC. That's a whole review you could look at. I have a whole discussion on what I think about that caliber. When it comes to cost effectiveness, I still think the 5.56 wins out currently. Subject to change. How about a match gun? A competition gun? Absolutely. It is that accurate. I mean, that is one of its, as you will see, one of its huge, huge pluses. Speaking about being dumb in YouTube, tube, and dude, I was more naive. I just didn't know. I mean, I used to write these huge, long sidebar descriptions on my videos till it finally dawned on me. And I put my likability scale like immediately. I'm like, dude, you're defeating your own product. My product is a video. I want people to consume my product, watch my product, reward the work. And if you write a big, long description, why do they have to watch your video? They just read a mini article of everything you say in the video. Duh. I told you. 
I'm learning. That's why sometimes you'll never see a sidebar description. You want to know what I think about it? Watch the dang video. I'll put a likability scale on this after it's been out a while. And it'll mesh with what you're getting right here, right here. Floss of use, competition gun, yeah. And I didn't look, I didn't research it. I'm sure some guys run around with MMP10s just tearing it up. No lie. There are a lot of competitive options. More so than we've ever had in this chambering. I'll mention a few, not all. Raw gun, I think 5.56 five, is better chambering for SAWC. Yeah, hunting gun, yeah. Uh, you're going to have to have blocked off magazine. Definitely light enough. One more. But I love the hitting power, man. 30 cal 308, is it the most powerful round out there? No. Get a Nemo and 300 win mag. Who can afford to shoot that? Nobody. How about design ergos? We'll talk a little bit about SAWC. The gun, as it comes nude out of the box, no mounts, no glass on it, eight pounds, three ounces by my weight. And that's with a 20, I think a 20 round PMAG in it. I always try to weigh the guns with a magazine in it. If I don't do that, I let you know. To me, that is a very lightweight, current with current technology, for a 308 sapper. In fact, it's one of the lightest 308s I brought to the table, if not the lightest. I didn't really go check. And it, before I forget, I love how Smith & Wesson has a Picatinny gas block on it and no sights. It'll reduce the cost a little bit, and they pretty much expect you're going to run an optic on it. I think that's a realistic approach, and it gives you a little bit more value. Now, as it's configured here, this MMP10 is 10 pounds, 4 ounces. That's uh, actually, I'm sorry, that was with a different scope. I had a Burris on it one time, so it's probably a little bit lighter with a Nikon M223. Now I know what you're thinking. You're like, why would you run an M223 on here? Shouldn't you want to run an M308? Uh, again, maybe a separate video. I'll tell you this. I don't like the M308. It has eye relief problems. Mm, had one, sent it back, hate it. The M223 is a completely different product. I'm spinning in it MOAs. I prefer those over mills still. I like it. This is good high value glass. It works very well. And the one piece mount, I forget the brand. I'll look it up and post it. That's a cool mount on there as well. So it's actually about 10 pounds. I wish I had my scale here. I double check it. It actually feels a little bit lighter with this scope on it. And you can see the magnification range that I have. It's going to be just a 3 to 12. And that's the glass I shot to 707 yards on, in case you're wondering. Now, there are some things you need to know about the M&P 10. We're talking about SAWC design and ergos. I'll go fast on this. It is kind of proprietary. Okay, so if you're an Armalite AR-10 dude, if you're like me, you have a DPMS, and you're saying, hey, what level of interchangeability can I have with a Smith & Wesson M&P 10? There's some, but it's not a lot. <laughs> okay, for instance, you, as far as I know, cannot put a DPMS barrel an Armalite barrel on an MMP-10. It's a proprietary gas system. It's a mid-length plus one inch gas system on the MMP-10. By the way, let me say this now. I love a mid-length gas system. I pretty much want to push the gas system farther away from the chamber. The gun will run smoother. It'll have higher longevity. I reduce temperature coming back into the bolt carrier group. That's just me. I don't like carbon length gas systems. I've always said that. My, I've always advocated the best barrel length size for AR-15. And in this case, maybe an AR-10 style rifle is 18 inches. And what do you know? Another win. The MMP-10 is an 18 inch barrel with a mid length plus one inch gas system. Downside, it's proprietary. You can't go buy a gas tube. Well, just a regular mid length gas tube. It's not going to fit. You'll have to go to Smith & Wesson. I'm not super concerned about that because I don't anticipate having to change this out. Maybe you would consider it. Okay. I want us to start here and come back and I'll tell you other things as I know it, information perhaps imperfect about what's proprietary, what's not. It is five eighths inch thread, so you can put a, a can on it. And I did, I will talk more about that in reliability. You'll find that interesting. Stay tuned. This is a proprietary muzzle, flash, uh, muzzle hider and flash hider. It will reduce recoil 
a bit. It's not timed right now because I had it just hand tighten on after I ran a can on it. That's in case you're looking and go, that's not time. Well, that's because I'm swapping it out. Uh, it's also, by the way, on that M&P 15 right there. And I've shot the crap out of that gun. Uh, I'm really surprised how much I like this. The push on this, I didn't really, while shooting it, and we did a bunch of drills with this. I never came away going, wow, that has a really funky push. I got a lot of muzzle rise with the M&P 10. I didn't even think about it. I was thinking about the target. That's how you know your muzzle device is working. It is rather, you know, lengthy. I'd prefer it to be super short like a battle comp, but actually, now that I think of it, the battle comp 7.62 is kind of long too. Heck, the M1A flash hider, super long. I don't know if I'd swap this out. I really don't. Take a look at it. It's got a little bit of scalloping there for contact. I like how they have big flats on it too, so it's easy to spin off. Some of them, like DPMS, they have these really tiny flats and you can't really get a, a crescent wrench or a wrench on it. I hate that. Decent. So, you can put whatever muzzle device you, on there, you want on there. I'd probably just run it. Now, let's get to the heart of the matter of what, the reason why I think this gun is so excellent. And actually, to be honest, why I think most Smith & Wesson AR-style rifles are really awesome. And that is the quality of their barrels. I'm kind of slow sometimes, and one of the things this year that has really dawned on me is you just can't shortcut the quality of a barrel in cost. If you're going to get a super quality barrel, you're usually going to have to pay some money. The way you'll manifest it is in accuracy, as this gun did. Super quality barrel shoots good as precision cut rifling. This is 5R rifling. Uh, raise your hand if you're a fan. That has it too. The other Smith & Wesson I reviewed also had it. The current ones don't. Depending on which model. But I, I will seek out and run 5R rifling. And this one is coated in melanite. Smith & Wesson doesn't call it melanite. Same thing. It's actually, in my opinion, better than chrome lining. It's a consistent finish. It's just as durable. It's slick. I, I love melanite. I'm a fan. So the, bear, the rifling is excellent. It is 4140. I don't think that's an issue. Some people say, well, it should be this steel or that steel. Uh, how many rounds are you really going to put through this? It's 308. R remember the cost of 308. Guys talk a lot on the internet. They talk out their butt all the time. Talk is free. Talk is cheap. Well, I'm going to burn a barrel out. Uh, I doubt it. Unless you're a sponsored shooter or a really aggressive hand-loading competitor, you might then. I could see that then, but I just, durability of jumping ahead, I just don't think you'll shoot this barrel out, from what I know. 308, you know, if it's a 22 long rifle, of course you won't have to worry about it then, you might have the rounds count. Okay, how about the profile, and I was talking about my prejudice, and it looks like a pencil barrel, doesn't it? The M&P 10, and I was very turned off by that. Not going to lie to you, it, I was just like, dang, why did they put a freaking pencil barrel on there? Here's the answer, they didn't. This is not a pencil barrel. Here comes both video and photos to illustrate my point. It looks like a pencil barrel. It goes to under the gas block area, 0.75 inches. And then after the gas block going towards a shooter, it actually starts tapering well, pretty up. Thick under there, actually. Pretty it's thick, actually. I didn't measure it. We looked at it visually. I took the handguard off when I swapped on this gas block. And by the way, this is a JP Enterprises adjustable gas block. I meant to bring the stock one. I'll get to why I put that on. But the other one is also flat top Picatinny, so same concept. But the barrel profile is actually pretty thick under the handguard. So it actually has the best of both worlds, where it's really important near the chamber area, says me, it's thicker, dampens vibrations, then as it comes past the gas block, you see what you see. We'll look at accuracy of how it does. Because like I say, the, the report card on your barrel is when you take it to the range and you shoot some very good groups with it, right? So the gas system's proprietary. This is just your standard polymer handguard. I didn't even look, but I don't think it has, it might, I should know this, but stainless, no, I think it's just plastic. So there's no stainless steel heat shield in there, no aluminum heat shield. Uh, I want it free floated. It's not. 
Again, look at the report card and you may decide you don't need to free, flo free float it. Delta ring there, that takes us to the receiver. It is proprietary MMP10. Okay, it's not interchangeable. 7075 T6 aluminum forged. Same stuff we see in all quality AR-15s, AR-10 style of rifles. It's good. They've got some, you know, this is pretty standard. Serrations on the front of the magwell. That, which I think is completely, you know, Ford Assist is just unnecessary in today's rifles. You may note, lefties, this has a lot of ambidextrous features. There's your safety, your bolt release, ambidextrous. Pretty cool. You still are ejecting to the right. And if you really don't like that and it bothers you, you'll, you might have to seek out some other options. I really didn't look out there and see what's available in 308 chambering. You know, maybe Stag's building something now. I don't know. Didn't look. Big Continue Rail 1913 specification. No surprise there. Speaking of proprietary, the charging handle is proprietary. What? Now, I did uh, check around, and you can fit some aftermarket charging handles there with some modifications. I don't know what that entails. Is it a minor dremeling thing? Maybe. I just don't know. Uh... I do like extended charging handles. I pretty much run them on most of my guns whenever I can. If I'm running a can on it, you know, maybe a gas buster style of charging handle. So it's venting the gas just a little bit more. Let me release this. Proprietariness. Uh, I'll crack it open probably somewhere along the review. The buffer tube is proprietary because it's a little bit longer, I think. It is mil spec in diameter. Buffer and buffer spring proprietary. Wah, wah. That sucks. Eh, I, it might. I'm not going to lie to you. It just depends on you if you plan on changing things. You know, if you want to run a rifle length stock on here, they'll st sell you a spacer where the buffer and buffer spring that are in there now will work. I think that's the sum total of it, of what's proprietary. The rest, like the trigger, you can swap that out. Notice it has an integral trigger guard. Flared out, so that will save you a little bit of money, not having to put on, you know, a Magpul one. Standard A2 pistol grip. I, it was not obnoxious. It's funny how we are with pistol grips. I mean, I'm that way too. I admit it. I like Magpul. I've tried a lot. I've tried Tango down. I've tried Ergos. I just keep coming back to Magpul ones. I love them. They're cool. They're just perfect. They have a perfect stippling. Ran this. Not obnoxious. You guys get it, I think. Look at, by the way, how I had to chew that, those bolts up on that mount. Oh, gosh. I didn't fully tighten the, the nuts when I went out there. I had to bring out the Leatherman S2 juice, and it did the tightening duties. And that was the price of uh, just how it had to be. I know what happens. But, dude, when people fly out and you got to do a shoot, you got to do what you got to do. Tighten it up, make sure it's consistent. Uh, six position, standard stock. It's okay. I mean, do we always have to swap this out? Mm, no. Maybe we're just a little bit elitist. Maybe we want to you know, go some second cool there. 37.6 inches overall length. I think some of that is due, again, to that long proprietary flash hider. And that will wrap it up for SAWC. Design ergos and all that crap. Firepower. By the way, this is Tactical Ammunition 168 grain nozzler. That is Hornady Amax 168 grain. Both are outstanding loads. This is a little bit hotter than that one. Shot a lot of them in testing, along with some other loads, which you'll see. 20 rounds as far as how many rounds it holds. Standard. Nothing to add there. It will take DPMS SR25 magazines. Those are not proprietary. That would have been a miss. Had Smith & Wesson come out and said, yeah, we're going to do our own magazine, I'd go, oh, whoa. Showstopper. And that will take us on to, I guess, accuracy. Let me do that. Oh, this is where the review gets fun. Why? Because when guns shoot well, it's fun for me. I said that in a recent review when I'm at the range. I just mentioned that. I was like, when guns aren't doing well, it, it's not fun. It's like your teacher. If you're flunking your course, you think he's like, oh, cool. I get to flunk this student. I'm so stoked. He's bombed. He wants you to do good, too. Speaking of doing good, that's first day, MMP10. I fast-tracked this review, by the way. 
That's just 10 yards. Mixed rounds. Is that me? That might have been Mike shooting that. This is Mike at 25 yards. He loved the gun. Mike Pappas. This is going out uh, 25 yards. This is when I was sighting in. Right here. That's sight in disregard. Three rounds. 25 yards? Don't laugh. I'm like, dude, if it's doing that good at 25 yards, uh, we might have a winner here. <laughs> and that's this ammo right here that Tathcl Ammunition puts together, which shoots really good. Out of most of the guns I put it down, it's good. It's good. Now we push it out to 100 yards, dude. Tackle ammo. Look at how that's shooting. That's pretty good. Here's that Hornady Amax. Look at that, dude. That's better than most, if I wouldn't say all, but most of the 308 bolt guns I brought to the table. That's this load right here. That's a one, three rounds, one hole group, ragged hole, out of the MP10. It's accurate. This was 165s. It printed kind of like this. It 168 is good. Pack A. It did not like lighter rounds. It does have a 1 in 10 twist, but in case you're wondering, Seller and Bellet, also around. I love. It's been very consistent. It shot that way. Those are all good trigger presses. So it's the gun, not me. Didn't like that one so much. So if you're going to run 150s out of it, maybe this is more what you can expect out of some loads. But here's Core Locked, Remington Core Locked. That's a decent group. That's a great hunting load, by the way. That's a great group, group right there. Here's that group of 165. That's a Hornady round, polymer. Last but not least, this is this is what I'm talking about. And this is the takeaway from this gun. 168 grain, tack A, three rounds, three rounds. Look at that. That excites me. An AR-15 normally is printing like that. That's pretty good. There's that AMAX shooting into one hole. Not made up. For reference, let's just look real quick at the DPMS TAC-20. That's an LR-308. This is from July 2011. I saved this target for purposes like this. Three round group, that's good. I was excited about that. Here's a 700P in 308. That might be a 300 Win Mag, I forget. But see, the this gun's beating that. That's a LR-308, LR-308. Last but not least, here comes the M1A, loaded version. Gold metal match, shooting 2.6 inches. Hmm, 1.8 inches there with XM762. Accuracy on the MMP10 is the heart of why I'm so excited about this gun. It's that 5R rifling, it's a melanite finish, it's a quality barrel done right. 5R. Reliability, durability. Well, I was talking about this, the adjustable gas block. Why is that necessary? Well, running the gun as it came from the factory was 100% reliable with all the loads we tested. And then I had the wild idea <laughs> as a reviewer, as a honest to goodness tester, consumer report style of tester. I, I got to run a can on this and see how it does. It did not like the can. It was a Gemtech HVT, too much back pressure completely unreliable when i screwed on the suppressor that's an odd okay and matt was there from smith and wesson i don't pull punches i do not you can ask matt i was like dude this thing needs to run with a can what's up and he's like i'm going to research it we'll find out and we had a discussion we determined and i learned i'm learning all the time too much back pressure so i start researching i go well i'll just put an adjustable gas block on it and see if i can dial it down I did it the very next day. Luckily, I have it on hand. I keep parts of all sorts and descriptions on hand so I can time, timeline and fast track these videos. I'm so glad I had it. Went out the very next day with the JP Enterprises adjustable gas block. And it's right there. Yes, there's Loctite on it. I really love this gas block. And I like JP. I've met him. Great dude. So glad that it's 100% reliable now. I had to spend some time. Had to spend a lot more ammunition to tweak it. It's a project. And no, I did not like that. I would prefer Smith & Wesson comes out with an MP10 with that feature already installed. This is a combat style of rifle. It should run with a suppressor on it. By way of reference, I also took out a 20 inch LR308 DPMS variety, threw that same can on it. Without any adjustments, it was reliable. For your reference.
That, by the way, is the hex key taped to the forearm so I can adjust that if and when I do. I don't like projects. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't like it when the manufacturer brings me a gun. I have to do a project. I'm a little irritated that I had to do it and spend money on an adjustable gas block. These are not cheap. And also, the JP will not allow me to put a, a Troy Alpha rail, you know, 308 variety, which I'd like to run to about here because it's too high. I got to research and get another gas block to do that. There you go. Like I said in the review though, do you need to put on a free float gas block when it's shooting as good as I showed you? Maybe not. I, I would just to, just for kicks, just to say, hey, will it get better? Like I said, this portion here is pretty thick. This portion here, which, you know, is forward of the gas block is thinner, but is it really affecting it? You know, I have some prejudices just like you do I'm pretty honest about them. Pencil barrels, I've mean, never been stoked on. I would say reliability, durability on the gun with that A+. Plus. Should come with it, though. Field strip. Ah, do you really need to see this? It's standard AR-15. I will do it just to show you on the inside in case you're wondering. In case you want to just look on the inside. I got a little push pin thing here. Take the mag out. It's gonna go quick though. Promises, promises. Oh, I'm so glad that happened right here. As I was pushing the gun, that, and it happened to me earlier, the retention pin on this takedown pin didn't retain. No minor issue, just, I don't know. For what it's worth, not much. Kind of irritated, I'm like, why did that thing pop out? There's your trigger, and I, I am so glad to remember this too. I forgot to talk about it. Smith and Wesson in their AR-15 and MMP in their AR-15 and MMP-10 rifles have some of the best stock triggers. They'll pull just over six pounds. Too heavy for me, but apparently good enough to hit targets at 700 yards. Would I replace the trigger? Mm, yes, I would. Because in the philosophy of use as a sapper, I want to have that in my court. And also, as I've said, I like the high rate of fire capability with a lighter trigger. Just ask your competitors, your three gun guys, they all do it. Very few run stock triggers. The aftermarket triggers, Timney's, Chip McCormick's, Geisley's, AR Gold, they're all good. And from what I know and from my own testing, pretty reliable. Okay, so here's your proprietary charging handle, proprietary bolt carrier, bolt, Chrome line gas key, chrome line bolt carrier, no surprise there. Right. Taking a look in there. Charging handle. I didn't even look to see if this had like feed ramp cutouts. Center I was shooting it fast, it does. It's got M4 cutouts in there. I don't know if you can see that. Hey, I'll take them if I can get them. Just cool. You know the staking of the gas key? Did I show you that enough? Good enough. Everything about this gun about every Smith & Wesson gun actually I've reviewed. Seems like it's quality. Accessories. We talked about the proprietary aspect. Whatever. You'll have to decide on that. To me, it's not a big deal. I don't worry about it at all because what I get in return. I would never swap the barrel out. I already put the gas block on. I'd probably run the flash hider on it. Trigger, I'll put in. Free float foreign, just like here. And that's why I have it on the table. I'll probably put that on eventually. Once I find a gas block, they'll fit underneath there. By the way, I got a JP on that one as well. I'd probably swap out the freaking buttstock and the grip. I probably would. What else you need? Probably nothing. How about options? First off, the price on the M&P 10, not the M&P 15 on the top. That'd be a lot cheaper. You know, I don't know why it is, but 308 rifles are just more expensive. I've talked about that in other reviews. Like a lot more expensive. <laughs> is it cheaper than a lot of options out there? Absolutely. For instance, go look at the LWRC Reaper. By the way, it's a chunk. 9.5 pounds with a 16-inch barrel? Piston? Who cares, though? DI is good. I love direct gas impingement. I've never, never criticized. I was like, this gets a, I was saying that in 2009 when everyone was like, oh, Pistons, way to go. Really? DI served this country well, dude. 
It's fine. You got to either clean it up here or clean it back there. What difference does it make? Well, you know, it's just more reliable. Well, no, it isn't. You know, and actually, if you're shooting steel case ammunition, do it with DI. Piston guns usually won't run it. That might be all you have is some wolf ammo. DI is a lot more forgiving, usually. How about the DPMS line? There's a ton out there. I still like them. And, you know, point of fact, I've never sold my DPMS LR308s. I like them too much. They're reliable. They're accurate. They are heavier than this. A lot heavier. But they're 20-inch, you know, barrels. Heavyweight barrels. Of course they're going to be heavier. They can do some sustained fire. I didn't incidentally notice any wandering with this barrel. I never let it cool down. Never even cleaned it. All the accuracy you saw was hot barrel. Shoot, 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 shoot. You've seen it on the video. I never sit down and let, let a battle rifle cool. You're going to do that in battle? DPMS Oracle, Recon, LR308, AP4, SAS, Sportacle. Good options, but they all have 16-inch barrels, which I've said in other reviews I don't like. I think it's too short. 18 inches is kind of like my minimum. It's too much blast, too much noise. I lose some velocity. I think 18 inches is short, but it's it gets the job done. Armalite AR-10s, Rock River, LAR-8s. They're about 9.3 pounds in operator garb. Elite Operator 2 garb, but that's too heavy. It's because that goofy front end rail that freaking Rock River uses. I don't like it. It's too much metal. The mid-length gas system A4, I'm talking the Rock River LAR-8, is about the same weight as this. 8.1 pounds. I don't know if that's with or without magazine. They're saying that's a 1.5 MOA rifle. Most of the Rock River stuff shoots so good. That is a direct competitor to the MMP-10, the LAR-8. Ruger SR-762. Hey, we told Ruger, hey, TMP, do a review. They're like, nah, we'll only give it to a bona fide reviewer. That's what Ruger said. That's right. Our view, some of my viewers said, hey, man, lone nut and fancy of SR-762. There's no way I'm buying that goofy rifle. Oops. Said it. They're like, no, we're not going to do that. I think they're scared of a negative review, to be honest with you. I expect companies to be mature, man. Call me crazy. That thing's nine pounds. That's all the 7.62s, unless it's a lightweight barrel. They're very proprietary. they got a proprietary everything. That rail, you talk about a proprietary piston system, yeah. And it's a 16-inch barrel. You know, subject to change. Maybe I'd shoot the rifle and totally love it. It could happen, but just looking outside in, 16-inch barrel, heavy gun, not interested. Breaks no new ground. To me, this kind of, oh yeah, the FN-17S. I love that gun. But it's $2,200, maybe more. With some pretty expensive magazines. These magazines aren't expensive. And they're totally reliable. Buy some, you know, DPMS mags. They'll run all day long. The takeaway is extremely accurate, this gun. As accurate as any 308 I've brought to the table. With really good ammo it likes. Not every ammunition. You saw that on some of the 150 loads, it's kind of dispersing. Good loads that have shot well out of other guns. Let's be honest. High quality components. High quality materials they've used. I like it. Not stupidly configured. They got a mid-length plus one-inch gas system. Love it. 18-inch barrel. Love it. Pick rail. No sights. Perfect. Easy to swap out stuff. The rest. Except when you put an adjustable gas block on. I can handle that. We talked about the version they need to come out with. They need to do it now. It needs to look just like this system here. Put the adjustable gas block out here if you want. And with that length, I mean right here. Just make it look just like the Nut and Fancy configured M&P 15. And you have yet another winner. But I would not hesitate buying this gun. It is my top rec recommendation for a Sapper 308 battle rifle subject to change. That is the honest truth as I see it. Nothing fancy. This hit. Couldn't quite tell where. Was hit again as a lower edge. Hit, I think it was a lower edge again. Nice shooting, boss. It takes a lot of concentration staying in the glass that long. 
I'm aiming upper right shoulder to compensate for the wind. You can see as you hit it, the dust and any miss, you can see the drift. Not a ton of wind, a little bit. Yeah, I mean upper right corner? Upper right shoulders where I was aiming this probably last 10 rounds. I only had what, two or three misses out of all those. I'm happy, yeah. happy with the gun, happy with the shooting. You're up, Mr. Matt. All right, man. He went a long range. He's getting it yep. in TMP. Right. I got to try to do better than you just did, man. I don't that's know if that's spirit. possible. I like, <laughs> I like that spirit. Not a single malfunction all day. Nope. Have you seen one? None. We've ran two MMP-10s and they've been 100%. Got to be at probably three, 400 rounds. Well, by the time this is all done, 500 rounds shot around there. 